Uh, you are uh, warmly welcome to the program, to the Ravish program. So I'm going to ask you questions in English. You answer me in English, but you should uh, wait for my translation into Kurdish. So uh, my first question to you is, uh, when did you come across, uh, where, when did you come into contact with the Kurds and Kurdish question? My first contact with the Kurdish issue in Turkey was when I started conducting um, trial observations for the Bar Human Rights Committee, the Bar of England and Wales Human Rights Committee. And that was back in 2012. Um, I was invited to go and observe this trial. 47 lawyers, 47 Kurdish lawyers had been arrested um, in Istanbul and held in custody. Um, there was a linking factor between these 47 lawyers, and that was that each of them had represented Abdullah Öcalan at some point in their professional career, either in domestic proceedings or in front of the European Court of Human Rights. So that was the linking factor. They hadn't all acted for him at the same time or in the same case, but nevertheless, they had at some point um, acted for him. And yeah, so before you uh, decided or your chambers decided to send you, did you have any background information uh, in the, about the situation of Kurdish people in general mm. in Turkey? No, really not. This was my very first experience of the Kurdish issue, and it was a, a very eye-opening introduction to the issue. Mm. I think we were all very shocked by what we found when we got there on the first occasion. It was very difficult to understand how an apparently very functioning modern legal system could be harnessed um, by uh, the, the politics of the situation. It seemed to us that this was a very political trial and really had very little to do with justice. Uh, could you please describe for me how was the first, uh, uh, I mean, the first trip, the first approach to the court, the first one, if you can remember? The first time I went, I think, was the second hearing in, in this trial. This or is this, a, a, yeah. a series of one-day hearings that have been carrying on yeah. since um, the very end of 2011, yeah. the beginning of 2012. And these trials take place uh, not in Istanbul, but outside Istanbul in the prison complex of, at Silivri. Silivri, yes. Uh, and where, as you know, there's a huge prison. And attached to this prison is a very um, huge courtroom. Um, and that's the first question that, that really comes to mind, is why was, it, why was it thought necessary to build a courtroom of that magnitude? Mm -hmm. Clearly, it was... How big is it? It's... it's oof, I don't... Um, it's 200, 100 meters yeah. long. Um, it's clearly designed for a mass trial, mass, trial, yeah. mass defendants. Mm -hmm. And you know, on this occasion, there were 47 defendants, 47 lawyers, each represented by several lawyers themselves, plus a huge international uh, delegation of observers, plus all the relations, friends, family of the defendants, all um, on the first occasion, packed into a very small room. Mm -hmm. um, but in later hearings, we were moved into this enormous So court if we stay in the first building. hearing, uh, could you please explain and uh, describe the situation? I mean, you said that there were international observers. Were ob other observers from other countries as well? Yes, there were observers from many European countries, from not only the UK, but also France and Germany and Greece. Mm -hmm. And I think also Holland. So there was a sizable international delegation. This was an issue that was taken um, very seriously. And part of the reason that it was taken so seriously was because approximately a year before um, I first went, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Lawyers and Judges had visited Turkey. Mm -hmm. What's her name? Uh, Gabriella Noor. Yeah. And she had written a very critical report of what she'd found on her visit. And one of the things that she'd highlighted was that the Turkish legal system was being used increasingly against its own lawyers. Mm -hmm. And she felt that this was clearly... Was it because that so many lawyers were arrested or what? Um, what yes, she, yeah, she yeah. was very concerned that mm -hmm. so many lawyers, particularly Kurdish lawyers, mm -hmm. were being arrested. And clearly there's something very awry if the legal system is dealing with so many of its own professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, and she felt that um, one of the things she noted was that the terrorism laws are very broadly framed, very broadly defined, mm -hmm. and that it was possible to really include um, 
a very broad section of society within that definition. By that, uh, she meant the terrorism laws in Europe or just in Turkey? In Turkey. Mm. Just in Turkey. These laws in yeah. Turkey. Yeah. She was very critical of the way that these mm -hmm. laws had been framed. Mm -hmm. Very broad, um, could encompass a wide range of behaviours. Mm. Um, behaviours that were not, uh, on the face of it, at all to do with terrorism. Uh, okay. and therefore they could be misused. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was your first impression of the defendants in the first uh, uh, hearing? How, what, what did they say in the first hearing? My first impression of these lawyers was here was a group uh, of professional people, you know, people very like myself, uh, very like my colleagues back in London, uh, who found themselves um, being charged with terrorism-related offences simply for carrying out their professional duties. Mm -hmm. Um, these are young, uh, sort of young lawyers, professional people. They have young families in Istanbul. Um, some of them had returned from overseas to face these charges. And despite this, despite these strong community ties, uh, these people had been kept in custody. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly, on the face of it, there's no reason for people, um, professional people with strong community ties, who voluntarily come to the court. Uh, to be kept in custody. Mm -hmm. So I think they were very shocked um, and very traumatized by this experience, having, you know, they've been taken from their families. Uh, some of them were very violently arrested. Uh, so I think they were very traumatized and we were quite shocked by um, what we saw. Yeah. Uh, so uh, these hearings uh, continue. So you have been all in all in five hearings, yeah? Uh, okay, uh, and then uh, now the situation is that the people are uh, uh, they, were they uh, d condemned to something? Extraordinarily, this trial continues. Mm -hmm. You know, despite the fact these people were arrested in November 2011, here we are in 2014 and this trial still continues. There still has been no resolution. And I think the reality is that this trial is about containing people that the state sees as Kurdish activists. Mm -hmm. um, the, the lawyers themselves, when I had an opportunity to speak to some of them, characterized themselves as um, hostages within a political process rather than as um, defendants within a trial process. Mm -hmm. um, and it's widely accepted really that the resolution to this matter is going to be is going to come from the wider uh, political situation, particularly from the peace process. Mm -hmm. What about the indictment? I mean, the, what the judge said or the prosecutor said in the court? Members. No, I mean, what you heard yourself in the, in the court. Mm -hmm. While you were in the court, what did the prosecutor said, for instance? The prosecutor said that these lawyers had, um, they had seen Ocalan mm -hmm. and rather than taking instructions from Ocalan as part of a legal defense of him. Mm -hmm. In fact, these legal conferences were an opportunity for Ocalan to um, spread his message mm -hmm. or spread his instructions, give his instructions to these lawyers to pass on to um, people in an e illegal organization mm -hmm. who would then carry out um, terrorist offenses. Yeah. So the, the prosecution case was, in summary, that the lawyers were Used, being used as knowingly as a means of communication between Abdullah Ocalan and um, people who were going to carry out terrorist mm -hmm. offences. And what was your impression from this accusation as a barrister, as a lawyer? Well, the evidence was very interesting. Um, the first point about the evidence is that much of it was illegally obtained through illegal tapping of phones mm -hmm. and um, taking people's private computers from their homes. Um, and all of that is in contravention of domestic law. Mm -hmm. So the first point is a lot of this information was illegally obtained. And the second point is that on the face of it, on the face of these communications, no offences were revealed. Mm -hmm. The, the um, evidence that I saw um, amounted really to quite normal conversations between lawyer and client, um, between lawyers and their friends, their family. And so on the face of it, there was nothing to suggest that any crimes had been committed. So the, prosecu the prosecution case had taken these normal conversations and twisted them and interpreted them in a certain way and said that this was some sort of code. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see that there was quite a leap between 
what we can see, what is evident, and what the prosecution has made of it. And um, in the court, when they were dealing with this evidence, the defence barristers were making very long and very detailed um, applications to exclude parts of these evidence, parts parts of the evidence, and to challenge parts of the evidence. Um, but and then the judge would listen. He would really ask them no questions. He would just listen silently. And at the end of the submission, turn to the prosecutor, ask the prosecutor what his view was. And the prosecutor would say, um, I ask you to reject these applications, mm -hmm. full stop. So the, the prosecution uh, submissions were extremely brief. And after hearing this, the judge would say, yes, I dismiss all these applications. Mm -hmm. So really, there was, there was no consideration Mm -hmm. of the defence case. Mm -hmm. It was clearly, um, the, it would have it appeared that the, the judge and the prosecutor were very much, you know, reading from the same script, as it were. They, mm -hmm. they clearly Apparently, were of the same mind. Mm -hmm. Apparently, I think it was in one of these hearings that the defendants, they asked to be allowed to speak in their own language, in Kurdish. Uh, what was the reaction of the court of that? Yes, the application to be allowed to conduct the defence in their own language, so-called defence, yeah, in yeah. the Kurdish mm -hmm. language, mm -hmm. was a, a recurring theme mm -hmm. throughout the hearings. It was All clearly time something came that up, was, huh? yeah. it was very important yeah. to these defendants for obvious reasons. Um, but after I think three hearings in February, I think of 2012, yeah. um, the law was changed, mm -hmm. and it was allowed. It was suddenly allowed for Kurdish defendants to defend themselves in their own language. And that was quite a momentous occasion. Mm -hmm. So we witnessed this, the first occasion on which Kurdish was spoken officially in, in a Turkish court. And mm -hmm. that was quite a sort of moving moment, really. Yeah. And then uh, later they were uh, uh, released on bail? In, in the first place, uh, the vast majority of these lawyers were, as I said at the beginning, were kept in custody. Mm -hmm. um, but no reasons were ever given. Yeah. which is yet another breach of domestic Turkish law. You know, all legal decisions should be backed up by fully reasoned uh, judgments, uh, and that provides a, a check and balance against um, arbitrary decisions, mm -hmm. and it gives you an opportunity to understand why that decision has been made, and then an opportunity to challenge it if necessary. Yeah. But no reasons were ever given, and as the trial continued, as, the, the, as we went through the hearings, at each hearing a small group of these defendants were released, maybe mm. five or six on each occasion. And again, no reasons were given for, for the releases. So it was sort of, it appeared to be fa fairly random as to which, mm -hmm. which people were going to be released. It wasn't known in advance which ones were going to be released. So it was very stressful, very traumatic mm -hmm. uh, for these people. Mm. Um, Yes. Now, as, uh, if you uh, now uh, after the uh, that they have been released on bail, did you have any opportunity to meet any any of these lawyers or speak to them? Yes. Uh, finally, um, at the last hearing, the the last remaining lawyers were released on on bail. So now everybody mm -hmm. has been released finally. Um, so that's one, some small small victory in this case. Um, at various stages, I've had the opportunity to speak directly to defendants, um, and that has been very illuminating. Um, they, they have characterized themselves really as hostages within the political process, mm -hmm. within, as I said, this wider political process. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and you know, of course, that these so-called KCK trials Yep. Uh, are much, much broader, much wider than mm -hmm. simply this trial, mm -hmm. and that thousands of Kurdish activists are facing um, charges within this kind of KCK process. Yep. Um, and it would appear that nothing is going to be resolved, really, until the Kurdish question is resolved. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, everybody was very hopeful um, after the new round of peace talks began, uh, that something could be accomplished for them. And certainly at various stages, the law has been amended. The law on freedom of expression was amended at one stage within the trial, which enabled certain of the KCK defendants to be released. Um, 
but not these not these defendants because these defendants are charged as i said with membership mm -hmm. of an illegal organization so mm -hmm. sadly they're still very much um, facing charges. Mm. They exposed, I mean, they, it could be possible that they will be rearrested again. The, the, the other KCK mm. defendants, yes. No, I mean, I mean this group that you had been in the trials. Mm. Well, they're still facing charges. Facing charges, yeah. yes. Mm. If, I suppose, if they decide at some point that it suits them, yeah. it may be that bail could be revoked. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you saw that there is a direct connection between these sort of trials and the peace process, in general, this peace process, which uh, it's called peace process, generally speaking, mm. uh, between the Turkish state and the Kurdish movement in uh, northern Kurdistan. Uh, what do you think yourself about the peace process or the negotiation between two I mean, uh, protagonists that you you have in, in Turkey. As a lawyer, as opposed to an expert on this particular yeah. political situation, I think there are various observations that I can make. The first one would be that um, there is no equality of arms uh, in this process. Mm -hmm. How can you really have a genuine negotiation around peace when one side is detained? Yeah particularly in the conditions in which he has been mm -hmm. detained. He's been in solitary confinement for, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously a very traumatizing situation to be in. Um, so the, f the first point is there, there's no equality. Mm -hmm. And really, if you're going to have genuine, meaningful negotiations, negotiations yeah. around mm -hmm. peace, mm -hmm. The, the parties need to be on an equal footing. He needs mm -hmm. to be released mm -hmm. in order to come to the table on, yeah. on a proper basis. Because uh, many times uh, my, one makes uh, some comparison with the situation, for instance, in South Africa, mm. when there was uh, negotiations between the apar apartheid regime and KNC and Mandela. So I think the real negotiations started when Mandela was released from prison. Yes, I, yeah. think, I think you're right. There are a lot of parallels between yeah the situation in Turkey with Ocalan mm. and um, the, the process between Mandela and mm. the apartheid regime. Mm. And there are some very obvious comparisons. Firstly, both of them were detainees on an island, sort of mm. kept away from yeah. the mainland. Um, but I, Mandela, I think, initiated the negotiations from prison, but it was only, as you say, after he was released, that real meaningful negotiations could begin mm -hmm. and that's clearly you know if we're going to make the same progress as was made in that scenario that that's the first step that needs to be done yeah. some of the observers also say that uh, in order that uh, real and genuine negotiations could start is that uh, that the PKK must be removed from the list of terrorist organizations in Turkey as you know there are also in some European countries and the United States this list is existing. Now, uh, do you think that it's a really precondition for uh, real negotiations? Yes, I mean, I think, f again, for meaningful negotiations to take, take place, how can a government negotiate with an illegal organization? It just mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, if the parties have reached the stage where they're prepared to talk, um, and we know that they have been, now it's out in the open that they are talking, uh, and they are doing exactly what uh, the defendants in this trial were doing. They are talking to Ocalan, mm -hmm. which is another reason why um, perhaps these lawyers should be uh, released uh, from all charges. Um, I think a lot of progress has been made on both sides um, about how this whole process needs to go forward. Um, clearly, there's a will on both sides for something, for progress to be made. and. Um, Ocalan himself has made various, given various guarantees, various offers about um, there being no more violence and that the focus now is on, not on auton autonomy, but on federalism. Mm -hmm. And that's something that... Um, By autonomy, you mean independent? Independent, yes. Uh, yes, yeah. okay. Yes, yeah. we're the, the emphasis now from the Kurdish side is mm. on having a federal yeah. um, or confederal um, position yeah. uh, and it's no longer sort of a movement for independence um, so clearly 
it's part of the same question to do with Ochlan himself. For there to be meaningful negotiations, there needs to be equality mm -hmm. between the two sides. And mm -hmm. if one side is considered to be illegal, is, is on the prescribed organization list, how can that really um, go ahead, go forward in any meaningful way? Um, we know that um, the situation is complicated by what's happening across the border in Syria mm -hmm. now. And we know also that the Syrian um, Kurds are fighting. The uh, Kurds from Rojava. Mm -hmm. are, are fighting <laughs> a very um, sustained defense in, in Rojava. Uh, Kobani, especially. In Kobani. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's very controversial now. Mm. How can. Um, Western forces, how can the American forces support um, the forces in Kobane mm -hmm. if they are affiliated or associated with a prescribed organization? So mm -hmm. it's causing all sorts of problems, mm -hmm. not only in Turkey, but in the wider region, that this prescription mm -hmm. remains. And it seems to me that th it's time for that to be looked at again. Yeah. Now. So in, by saying so, uh, there are some uh, political scientists that they say that uh, really to look at the questions from a, just a legal uh, 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 perspective mm. does not work all the time. I mean, because uh, the politics in reality, there are sometimes that uh, these sort of, let's say, laws and things could be trampled upon d d depending on the balance of power. And in the case of, for instance, uh, that in reality, the uh, international, uh, let's say, coalition is just working with the Kurds, both, uh, I mean, especially in the Rojava. So do you also agree with this interpretation of s political scientists? The only answer mm -hmm. to these sort of questions. Um, there does need to be political movement uh, and, and political acceptance mm -hmm. of change of this magnitude, really. Mm -hmm. um, the law is obviously a very, can be a very helpful tool in terms to um, to get change, mm -hmm. but um, as we've seen, legal systems, you know, as we saw in relation to this trial of the lawyers, legal systems can be harnessed by political forces and used um, against justice, really. Mm -hmm. And so, law is only as good as the people applying it mm -hmm. and implementing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can have on paper the best laws in the world, but if the judges and the politicians behind the judges are not committed to the judges being independent, to there being a real justice process, mm -hmm. those laws are going to be abused and, and used for the wrong purposes. Mm -hmm. Now, if uh, we go back to the situation of uh, Mr. Ojalan, uh, as you may know, there is an international uh, initiative. It's called International Initiative for, uh, 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 for uh, Truth, Find uh, invest, uh, truth investigation, the same as it re there was in South Africa, uh, which are many uh, well-known uh, international personalities are uh, involved in that, like uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu mm. uh, and uh, through the other people who are working in elders group that he is very active there. Do do you think that, uh, for instance, uh, your uh, colleagues and you, I mean, generally speaking, the barristers, the lawyers in Britain can be more active in this case? I'm aware that this, there is this initiative mm -hmm. which seems like a very um, constructive way forward. Yeah. And clearly, if you have people like Desmond Tutu involved in it, you have people with real experience of, of seeing this sort of process through to a, a good and meaningful resolution. Um, and now you do have um, international lawyers involved in the kind of the wider issues, mm -hmm. um, people who've been observing this trial and more widely observing other trials across Turkey. So there's there's a lot of international legal concern. Um, and so if there was a way that international lawyers could be part of any commission, mm -hmm. Truth um, and Justice Commission, mm -hmm. um, I think that would be that would be excellent mm -hmm. because you could bring in all the um, expertise from other countries, uh, the experience, uh, and really bring it to bear on, on this question. Yeah. So uh, we, I know that uh, you had also a fact-finding a fact mission to uh, 
Southern Kurdistan, yeah. uh, and I think you stayed some time there, and uh, especially you looked at this treatment of the journalists uh, and uh, freedom of speech. Uh, you can also elaborate and uh, describe a little about your uh, trip there. Yes, in September of this year, I visited the Kurdish regional government area mm -hmm. in, in Iraq. Um, I went there on behalf of an NGO, an independent NGO, the Gulf Center for mm -hmm. Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And I was looking specifically... This Gulf Center for Human Rights is active in the... Uh, where? In the Gulf region, Yemen. generally, but yeah. also in Iraq and also Yemen mm -hmm. and Iran, so mm -hmm. yeah. kind of across that region. Yeah. And one of the focuses of, of this organization is um, not only support of human rights defenders, but also a particular focus on freedom of expression. Yeah, yes. And um, that's what I was looking at on this occasion, was to what extent is freedom of expression restricted uh, in the KRG mm -hmm. area? Um, are independent journalists free to write what they like? Uh, to what extent do government or non-government actors seek to, to restrict it? Um, and the first thing that I think that I noticed was that uh, the press overall is flourishing mm -hmm. and that writers are flourishing in that area. Uh, it seems to be a hugely literary um, culture mm -hmm. there. And there are so many different newspapers, so many different media outlets, and that gives you great cause for optimism. Uh, and clearly, you know, that region in, in terms of the wider Iraq is seen as a safe haven for people who are fleeing some of the chaos that's occurring sort of in, in Iraq uh, more widely. So there was a, lots of cause for optimism about what mm -hmm. I found there. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, having said that, there are also um, very serious concerns about restrictions on freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> there have, in fact, been some assassinations of journalists who've crossed what are termed the red lines. Mm -hmm. And there are very clearly anybody who works in that field in that region is very aware of where the red lines are, mm -hmm. sort of self-imposed um, lines that they will not cross. For example, one cannot discuss um, the family of the leading um, politicians mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. That is a very dangerous thing to do. Um, and <coughs> it's feared that, um, for example, um, Sardasht um, Osman, mm -hmm. a young journalist, a young student who wrote a poem that did uh, mention uh, the family mm -hmm. of one of these uh, political families, was later um, assassinated. Mm -hmm. And the fear is that this was a direct um, correlation to this poem that he'd written. Yeah. Um, so these red lines are very um, May I ask clear. Uh, well, wh whom uh, did you meet? Uh, where did you get your information from? I met um, the editors of various independent newspapers, yeah. including Awene. Mm -hmm. um, I met the directors of NRT, Television, television station, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I met people from, um, I have to pause here to try and remember what it's called. Um, <coughs> there's an organization, sorry. Defending what? Defending the right of uh, journalists or what? Journalists. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry. Yes. And then? Um, so I met independent journalists. Yeah. Um, I met uh, people from civil society organizations yeah, yeah. Uh, and I met as I say people from NRT television, Awene Press. Um, but you, do, you didn't come into contact with the uh, people for instance the uh, let's say uh, foreign uh, affairs uh, department of the KRG? No. The, no. no. You didn't want to or you didn't I didn't ask have an opportunity on this uh, occasion. Okay. Um, although I would very much like to have that opportunity, okay. and I'd be I would welcome their comments on. So, on the did you have you made. have you read uh, have you written any report about this trip? Published um, something? It's made about a report. Yeah. It's not yet published. Yeah. It is about to be published uh, in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so possibly by the time this program goes out, it will be published. Maybe about the same time. Mm -hmm. um, 
But yes, it, the, the strong feeling was that um, the, the main political parties, um, their reach extends too far into uh, the world of the press. Mm -hmm. uh, it was felt that the influence of these political parties is, is very strong. Uh, it's very difficult to be truly independent. Uh, the sort of categories of the press was explained to me in these terms that you have the first category, sort of very overtly political media, who uh, do follow a party political line. Clearly, it's obvious that that's what they're doing, and they don't seek to hide that. Then the second category is what is termed the shadow media, mm -hmm. who portray themselves as independent, but are really uh, under the influence of one or other of the political parties, but it's not overt. And then thirdly, the smallest group are the truly independent journalists who bravely um, plough their own furrow, who have their own voice, um, and on occasions do sort of cross these red lines mm -hmm. uh, and will broach the subject particularly of corruption, which mm. is um, also a, a significant issue in, in the region. Yeah, uh, but uh, taking into account that uh, because the situation is very chaotic, mm. do you think that your observations in what way it can have a kind of positive impact to change the things to the better? Well, the aim and objective of, of a mission like that is to, to give support mm. to um, the people who are bravely um, struggling to get an independent voice heard. Mm. Um, so the idea is that you raise their profile, um, you give them a voice, you give them th the support of international organizations uh, in the hope that, that they don't feel alone and in the hope that this does give them uh, a feeling of solidarity mm -hmm. uh, and a feeling that what they're doing is important and is recognized by their colleagues sort of more widely mm -hmm. um, outside the, the KRG. Okay. Now, we have uh, not uh, too much time uh, left, but uh, I would like you to explain a bit about your uh, golf uh, committee as well. Can you just uh, say... Uh, the Gulf Center The Gulf Center, rights. yes. Mm. Uh, the way that you are working there. Mm. Yes. Well, I'm... I'm on the board of the Gulf mm. Center of Human Rights, on the advisory board, mm. so as a lawyer, as an independent lawyer, I ha um, have been asked to be on the board, so um, I have a role in sort of advising the organization. Um, as I say, it's an independent organization, it's not funded by any governments, mm -hmm. um, and it seeks to support human rights defenders. Primarily, that's the primary role of it. Um, so we would issue appeals if somebody was uh, arbitrarily detained, for example, for their political activities or their human rights activities. We would issue an appeal. We would uh, explain what's happened to them, try and establish uh, the objective facts about what's happened to them, um, publish it, um, give it some international profile. Mm -hmm. We'd also seek to utilize uh, the mechanisms of the United Nations to assist um, um, to uh, to talk to special rapporteurs, for example, mm -hmm. to uh, try and get information to the special rapporteurs, um, to enable them to play a role in the country, maybe to organize a country visit. Um, recently, the special rapporteur for freedom of assembly um, visited Oman, mm -hmm. uh, following a long kind of history of problems in that country, mm -hmm. and he visited um, just a couple of months ago and wrote a very critical initial report about the, the circumstances that he found there. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Maroni. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>